District of Conservation is sponsored by CFACT. To learn more about our sponsor, head over to CFACT.org. Thank you so much for listening to the show. Welcome to District of Conservation. I'm your host, Gabriella Hoffman. This podcast offers a sober examination into all things hunting, fishing, shooting sports, energy, environment, and the public policy surrounding it. And this podcast also specializes in original interviews that you won't hear elsewhere. Here's what I have for you today. On this special Thursday episode, we're going to dive deep into three news items that have been overlooked or missed. First, I'm going to touch upon Elon Musk coming out against ESG. That's a very off-talked about subject relating to social corporate responsibility with respect to the environment, and we'll dive deep into that. Secondly, we're going to have a 30 by 30 update. There was a letter sent by congressional Republicans concerning this in terms of enforcement. And then I'm going to talk briefly about a local Virginia case relating to a topic about dog hunting and right to retrieve and preview my upcoming conversation with Andrew Pullen, someone I've known in politics for a while. We've been connected online for a substantial amount of time. He's a dog hunter and he's going to weigh in on this lawsuit that is being filed against the Department of Wildlife Resources and whether or not some bad actors in dog hunting could potentially ruin the sport. So that is what I have for you all today. Let's dive deep into it. Elon Musk is a really fascinating character, and I'm not trying to inject him here for getting more attention to the podcast, but I think ESG does relate to conservation in many ways and environmental practices. So I feel it very incumbent upon me to address this. He is newsworthy. He's a very fascinating guy. He's an electric vehicle maker who has started to kind of question a lot of the people he was surrounding and some of the ideas he was espousing. And I remember reading and watching his interview with the Babylon Bee, where he, even as an EV maker, had confessed that fossil fuels will still play an integral role in the grid, electric grid, for a while. He was practical about that, made that admission. He also has said that he regrets taking, I remember he said this very concretely, he regretted taking a loan from the Department of Energy to boost Tesla. So that was really an interesting admission on him. And he's just a kind of contrarian guy. And he had tweeted not too long ago about his qualms with ESG. And I have a blog post at Independent Women's Forum explaining this. So I'm going to briefly read this for you. So he tweeted a few days ago that Tesla being removed from the S&P Global 500 list from their ESG index should be called into question. And he tweeted, Exxon is rated top 10 best in world for environment, social, and governance, ESG, by S&P 500. While Tesla didn't make the list, ESG is a scam. It has been weaponized by phony social justice warriors, he tweeted. And then he continued by saying, S&P global ratings has lost their integrity. And he posted these comments in response to the S&P global downgrading Tesla for S&P 500 ESG index. And they expanded on a blog post, the S&P Global, about why it was removed. And they claim it's because they're not doing enough to decarbonize and they have questionable codes of business conduct. And this is according to the S&P Global. A few of the factors contributing to Tesla's 2021 S&P DGI ESG score declining in criteria levels related to Tesla's lack of low carbon stake strategy and codes of business conduct. In addition, a media and stakeholder analysis, a process that seeks to identify a company's current and potential future exposure to risk stemming from its involvement in a controversial incident, identified two separate events centered around claims of racial discrimination and poor working conditions at Tesla's Fremont factory in California, as well as handling of NHTSA investigation after multiple deaths and injuries were linked to its autopilot vehicles. Both of those events had a negative impact on the company's S&P DGI ESG score at the criteria level and subsequently its overall score. While Tesla may be playing its part in taking fuel powered cars off the road, it has fallen behind its peers when examined through a wider ESG lens. Unsurprisingly, Tesla hit back and they put out their 2021 impact report criticizing the S&P Global, writing current environmental, social and governance reporting does not measure the scope of positive impact on the world. Instead, it focuses on measuring the dollar value of risk return. Individual investors 
who entrust their money to ESG funds of large investment institutions are perhaps unaware that their money can be used to buy shares of companies that make climate change worse, not better. And before we dive deep into kind of the questions surrounding ESG, we brought on Independent Women's Forum policy analyst Charlotte Whalen, who I work very closely with when I'm covering energy and environment for my fellowship with them. And she talked at length about ESG. She writes about ESG often for IWF. And we brought her on the podcast to talk about this subject in more detail. It's being oft discussed. It's a topic of discussion in the business realm and media in energy and environment. And you're going to hear more about it and we're going to cover it more. And Charlotte has described ESG pretty simply. If you don't know what it is, she says ESG is a set of criteria that measures a business's commitment to environmental, social, and governance ESG principles. Often, these take the form of environmental sustainability practices, social justice issues, and democratic and fair corporate governance. And she had talked about this in her policy focus, and I'm skipping a little over, but here's what she says about it. While it sounds really great and that it, the ESG principles can come in many forms, she calls some forms commendable, such as pledging to not use products made by slave labor. She calls other ESG practices misguided, like committing to net zero carbon emissions, even though we lack the technology to make that a sound financial or realistic goal. More interestingly enough, Elon Musk is not the only person to criticize ESG. I had actually done some research for this IWF post, and I came across a BlackRock a former BlackRock sustainable investing chief, Tariq Fancy, who wrote last summer in August of 2021, a long essay essentially comparing ESG to a dangerous placebo. And it's a great three-part essay. I recommend you read it. I don't agree with everything that was posted or claimed in his article, but I like that he criticized ESG. He talked about it from obviously a sustainable perspective. He seems to be a subject matter expert on this. So when you see someone like that criticizing ESG and some of pointing out some of its faults, you want to pay attention and listen. And I think the American public will. So briefly an excerpt from his posts on medium, it's a three part piece, but from medium, he says green bonds where companies raise debt for environmentally friendly uses is one of the largest and fastest growing categories in sustainable investing with a market size that now has passed $1 trillion dollars. In practice, it's not totally clear if they create much positive environmental impact that would not have occurred otherwise, since most companies have a few qualifying green initiatives that they can raise green bonds to specifically fund while not increasing or altering their overall plans. And then he writes a little bit more about how do people come to conclusions about ESG and whether their methods and conclusions are sound. And he says, after reading a few pro ESG papers, whose methods and conclusions I found rather dubious, something occurred to me. There's always money to be made from telling people what they want to hear. So ESG principles can be subjective. They can be misinterpreted. It could be virtue signaling. So you see people who have worked in sustainability issues in major investing firms, VC firms relating to obviously wall street and all that calling this practice into question. Are these principles really commendable? Do they have a measurable impact? Are they just mere virtue signaling? Do they go too far or do they go too little in terms of the impact? So read his article and even Harvard Business Review, not a conservative outlet by any means. They're pretty nonpartisan for the most part. When it comes to business practices, sometimes they have some commenters who very much align themselves to kind of anti-capitalist attitudes, but in my reading of them, especially on this issue, it's been fairly fair. But the Harvest Business Review notes, to begin with, ESG funds certainly perform poorly in financial terms. So they're not as profitable when you adopt these principles. Does it lead to enhancing your bottom line, more shareholders, more interest in the company? Not so much, according to the Harvard Business Review. To begin with, ESG funds certainly perform poorly in financial terms. In a recent Journal of Finance paper, University of Chicago researchers analyzed the Morningstar sustainability ratings of more than 200,000 mutual funds representing over $8 trillion of investor savings. Although the highest rated funds in terms of sustainability certainly attracted more capital than the lowest funded rates, none of the high sustainability funds outperformed any of the lowest rated funds. Very fascinating. I still need to learn a lot more about ESG. 
I am not an expert by any means, but I'm being tasked with writing about it more. I should understand it, working a little bit in business and in the environmental beat. So you will hear more about ESG, but it's very fascinating that Elon Musk has called it a scam. Uh, Even people like former BlackRock chief sustainability officer, Tariq Fancy has even criticized it. So I think you're going to see more people in the corporate space come out against this as it proves to be not as impactful or good for capital as it is touted to be. So that is kind of ESG in a nutshell. Figured we'd talk about that. And if you want to learn more, head to the show notes. We have a lot of resources on ESG available for you. Next up, we have an interesting update on opposition to 30 by 30, which is a very nice sounding proposal to conserve public lands and waters by 2030. We've broken down the numbers. I've spoken at the Stop 30 by 30 Summit. (laughs) Some people who call themselves conservationists have accused me of being a disseminator of misinformation on this topic, although I've taken all my information from the federal government, from the geological service. Funny, I don't think they know how to extrapolate data, but hey, if taking government data makes me a misinformer, then misinformation really is not judged on a objective lens, but that's besides the point. Let's read briefly from a letter issued by Senators Kramer of North Dakota, Marshall, and 19 other Republicans. It is Senators Kramer, Marshall, colleagues demand NEPA review of Biden administration's undefined 30 by 30 initiative. They sent a letter to White House Council on Environmental Quality, CEQ Chair Brenda Mallory, demanding they adhere to the National Environmental Policy Act requirements and undergo the proper analysis and public comment period for the Biden administration's goal of conserving at least 30% of lands and waters by 2030, otherwise known as 30 by 30. And we will link to the letter, but here's a brief excerpt. To reach 30% by 2030, hundreds of millions of acres of land and water will be impacted. A program of this magnitude requires solid legal authority and a clear plan, yet the administration has articulated neither, leaving our constituents in the dark. What is clear, however, is the departments are implementing the 30 by 30 initiative without first analyzing the program's public and environmental impact, as required by NEPA. We are calling on you to refrain from any actions in the furtherance of 30 by 30 until a programmatic environmental impact statement has been completed and the legal authority under which the major federal program is proceeding has been disclosed. The letter argues 30 by 30, which despite the promises of transparency and consultation is moving forward without public input, constitutes a major federal action and is thus subject to NEPA to ensure federal agencies identify and carefully consider the program's impact on the environment. So you start to see more and more lawmakers taking a stance on this. I didn't know that actually it had to go through NEPA. And we are learning as we go on this issue, of course. But yes, it would make sense actually that a grand scale plan like this would have to be subjected to NEPA, the NEPA review process, given how big and vast and unclear it is. We've talked about 3030. What are the terms defined? How will this be impacted? I've read into 3030 even more that they will use the Antiquities Act to proceed in a more timely manner their goals of conserving lands. But Utah already, as I mentioned, Utah already conserves 63% of their land far beyond the threshold laid out by this goal or by the 30 by 30 plan. And if you look at the U.S. Geological Survey, when you account for, I think it's three or four different tiers, it shows that the U.S. on a nationwide scale already conserves over 40% of lands. About 23% of oceans are conserved according to available data from what I read. So they may try to push it on that. But on the land side, already a lot of land is conserved, preserved more so, and protected against multiple uses. So that is putting into the heads of the senators a lot of questions. I think the public is starting to have questions on 30 by 30, given the lack of definition of what conservation entails. I've argued that this plan, unfortunately, is preservationist in nature. They say that they're going to invest in stakeholder relations. They're going to have input from people. But when I talk to people out West and I've talked to other stakeholders, I was just in Utah and Arizona. A lot of people I spoke to in both of those states have said they have grave concerns about 30 by 30. It's much like I said, the weaponization of national monuments, designations taken way out of the scope of presidential authority. So there are a lot of concerns 30 by 30 deserves a lot of scrutiny. We've talked about that here. And I have friends who support 30 by 30, and it's okay if you support it. We're just going to call into question about some of its metrics. And we should have robust debate on this subject. I think it deserves to have debate because if you just implement a plan without any questions, what are the implications that stem from that? Does it take out stakeholders 
from the equation with respect to conservation involvement. What's that going to entail? Are people going to lose public lands access? That has to be called into question as well. A lot of people say, well, this is done for the enhancement of public lands access, but you look in different states, it actually keeps stakeholders and recreational users outside of access to public lands. We'll be exploring that more in Conservation Nation coming up very soon and here on the podcast as well. So we are starting to see more congressional members call into question 30 by 30 as efforts to implement it ramp up. So we will keep you all abreast with that as this battle proceeds. The third topic we're going to discuss, it's kind of a primer for Monday's podcast episode. We have an interview with Andrew Poland. He is a political activist and also an avid dog hunter here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We've been connected for some time. He's invited me to come see dog hunting at work. He, as a dog hunter, is really, really concerned by some in the dog hunting world here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, abusing right to retrieve to violate private property rights. And he posted an article from the Richmond Times Dispatch, one of our big daily newspapers here in the Commonwealth. And the lawsuit, which is the Pacific Legal Foundation suing the Department of Wildlife Resources, who isn't taking a side in right to retrieve. The agency is just implementing the law. They're tasked with enforcing the law. So it's not supposed to be an indictment of the DWR. The DWR does great stuff for the Commonwealth. They safeguard our resources. They make it accessible for us to fish and hunt, and they offer us wide opportunities. We're not criticizing them. And I think the lawsuit should be interpreted as like, it's not an indictment of the DWR. And Andrew and I are going to talk about whether or not the right to retrieve should be discussed at the general assembly level. If let's say a ruling comes out and says that the agency doesn't do a surefire job of protecting private property rights, then that issue will probably be brought back to the General Assembly, our General Assembly. And I think there could be an appetite to reform the law. It's from 1938. It covers 400 plus years of dog hunting here in Virginia. Andrew is going to explain what dog hunting entails, what are the good things about it, how the art of dog hunting gets undermined by certain dog hunting interests, why you can simultaneously be a dog hunter, but also protect private property rights. So you will not want to miss this if you are looking for unique underreported subjects that are kind of regional. I really think you'll enjoy this and kind of get a bird's eye view into kind of a very big hunting battle here in the Commonwealth. I've had to learn about this issue in my decade here, get myself familiar. I really don't have a stance one way or another. I support all forms of hunting as long as it's done ethically. So I think we have to give kind of the dog hunting perspective, some light here and talk about bad faith actors who do want to ruin it and who just have disregard for property rights because they think their desire to go dog hunting supersedes laws in the book. So we're going to dive deep into that Monday. You don't want to miss it. So stay tuned for that. I can't wait to share our interview with Andrew Pullen with you all. Thanks for listening to District of Conservation. If you haven't already, please be sure to subscribe to us on your preferred podcast player. We recommend Apple Podcast, where over 60% of our listenership hails from. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, which don't really populate, but follow us on social media to make sure you never miss a beat or a guest announcement. You can also find us on CFAC's website under District of Conservation under my profile, Gabriella Hoffman, to catch up on all different past episodes there. If you like what you hear, be sure to leave us a five-star review on Apple or wherever podcasts are played. Share the links leave your reviews, and tell your friends about the show. Thanks for listening today. Stay tuned for more District of Conservation episodes.